episode 242 of the Aggressive Progressive Podcast, Waiting for the Trial of the Century. Let's start the show. We are now the defenders of the stronghold of democracy and of equal opportunity. You and I as citizens have the obligation to shape the debates of our time, not only with the votes we cast, but with the voices we lift. The people are looking for honest answers, not easy answers. The very word secrecy is repugnant. Clear leadership. And we are as a people. Not false claims and evasiveness and politics as usual. Opposed to secret society. But ours was a nation of the battle. Not the bullet. And a secret pursuit. As a people, we cannot afford to let any group of citizens or any individual citizens live or labor under conditions which are injurious to the commonwealth. Black, white, Latino, Asian, Native American, young, old, gay, straight, men, women, folks with disabilities, all pledging allegiance under the same proud flag to this big, bold country that we love. That's what I see. That's the America I know. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. There is nothing wrong with America that cannot be cured by what is right with America. Welcome to the Aggressive Progressive Podcast. I am your host, Chris Hahn. Uh, thank you for liking, rating, reviewing, subscribing, telling your friends about the podcast. Truly, truly appreciate it. So Trump will be on trial for the next couple of weeks in New York for the hush money payment to the porn star he had sex with. Paid her not to talk. Had sex with her a couple of days couple of days after the birth of his child also had sex with a playboy playmate similar time catch and kill with the national Enquirer. i'm sure this will go over really well with religious conservatives across this country who believe that trump is a flawed man but he has repented from his ways of course Should evidence emerge in the next couple of weeks that he's still doing similar things, and believe me, I don't think this man has changed his ways, okay? I think there's a little bit more of a tight grip around him and makes it harder for him to indulge like he used to. And of course, he's not quite the celebrity that's attracting young women anymore that he once was. He's now like a hero to, you know, really old white men, mostly. Some of their wives are young and maybe he tries to hit on them. It would be kind of funny if, you know, we find out that Trump has been having dalliances with some rich conservatives, young wife. I think that'd be fun. Uh, we'll, we'll see if that comes out this week. Um, I, I Look, I, I'm not judging him on this lifestyle. I'm really not. I, I, I don't care. I honestly don't care. I do care that people who support him still, even knowing all this, are the same people who, you know, you know, what about the children crowd? You know, the what about the children, the same people who ran Howard Stern off of terrestrial radio are voting for Donald Trump, actively supporting him, knowing who he is, right? They know full well who he is. And I don't expect the leaders who were hypocrites all along to change their mind and suddenly want somebody else in as the Republican nominee or just not show up. But I just think that there are enough good people who truly believe in family values, who are truly family value conservatives. I don't think there's many of them, but there might be five or 10% of the conservative movement that is that. And if one or 2% of that 10% decide not to vote, that's plenty. And I don't know how having these conversations day in and day out. Now, I get it. People say every time Trump looks like a victim, his poll numbers go up. Is he going to look like a victim here? Is he going to look like he's a victim? Again, nobody, including Trump, is not saying. Nobody, Nobody is saying, I should say, nobody is saying that Trump didn't do this. They are just whining and complaining that the law is being applied to him here. Oh, how dare they? Let me just point something out. Michael Cohen has already served time in prison for the Stormy Daniels hush money. 
fiasco that Trump engaged in. He has already been to prison. Trump was an unindicted co-conspirator in that matter. He was referred to as individual one. Yet for some reason, the Department of Justice decided not to pursue charges against individual one, even after individual one was no longer president of the United States. So the state of New York has taken it upon themselves to do the honors of this. Now, again, not the first case I would have brought. I don't know why Merrick Garland didn't bring cases related to January 6th immediately, like in 2021, when it was still fresh in everyone's mind and conservatives hadn't rewritten what happened that day. That would have been a great time for Merrick Garland to bring those kinds of charges. He didn't do that. He failed to bring those charges when they would have been most effective. And I guess here in New York City, people were waiting waiting and waiting and waiting for that to happen. And they said, you know what? We're going to do this because no person is above the law. And if there was a crime committed that was big enough of a crime for Michael Cohen to go to jail for three years, well, Donald Trump better get some consequences too. Now he's been trying to get this, uh, this case moved to Staten Island where he actually won the borough of New York city, where he, he won outside of Manhattan where he lost like 85% of the vote voted against him. But I'll tell you, that's still, that, that 15% is still a pretty big number. In fact, that 15% in Manhattan County, in New York County, would be more than anybody, more than any of the votes he got in any county in Wyoming. Think about that for me. That's how big Manhattan is. And I do believe that jurors can be non-partial regardless of their political ideology. I think that's what America is about, Right. That we, we have to look at the law, look at the flat facts and apply them equally, blindly, if you will. And that's what jury selection's for. If they can't find, you know, 12 jurors that are going to be impartial, they're not doing their job. I don't think we need breathless 24-hour coverage of jury selection in the uh, Trump trial in New York City. A jury selection is going to take at least a week, maybe two weeks. And the only thing that happens during jury selection is maybe you get an anecdote about a juror's reason for getting off the jury. Right? I, I, you know, the, the networks have set up camp outside the Manhattan criminal court. Um, well, there was a motion today. I, I'm getting flashbacks of civil procedure, actually criminal procedure, which is a course you take when you're in law school. Uh, and, you know, hearing about these motions on various gag orders and jury selection uh, questionnaires and other, uh, you know, for, for a recovering lawyer like myself, the coverage on Monday was a little excessive, in my opinion. I, I think it's been excessive all along. Now, here's the coverage I'm looking forward to. When a witness that we are not aware of suddenly materializes and testifies about Donald Trump's behavior. Something new for the public to learn. When Stormy Daniels testifies and then comes out with all the salacious details of what happened in their uh, encounter, if you will, the encounter that caused the president, the former president, to pay her off to avoid public humiliation in violation of election law. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to her coming out and holding a press conference about what she did with Donald Trump and how they paid her off for it to keep her quiet. That is what I am looking forward to. You know, sitting around uh, wondering what the jurors are having for lunch, uh, wondering why the judge took a two-hour lunch break. I, I don't need that kind of speculation. I, you know, the, I again, I, I'm not trying to say that these pundits who are on talking breathlessly about legal issues don't deserve to make a living. I think they do deserve to make a living. I myself am a pundit and make part of my living that way. So I understand the need to capitalize on events, just like I will capitalize on the conventions, which are boring and process laden and will be there looking, you know, for, for conversation points. I get it, but I'm just, I'm just complaining 
because this is my show and my microphone right now, and I have an opportunity to rant about things I don't like. And uh, I don't like it. I'd rather than be talking about the very complex matter happening in the Middle East, because it's a very complex matter, right? Middle East uh, uh, diplomacy in the wake of Iran, not its proxies, but Iran itself launching a volley, a massive volley of missiles and drones at Israel has to be responded to, right? I've been thinking about this a lot. And maybe we have a conversation about why it has to be responded to. Why, you know, for years there was this deterrence factor that if you attacked Israel, you better be prepared for your own uh, annihilation if you were a Middle East country. Um, And again, I I don't think anybody wants a full-scale war between Iran and Israel. That would lead to a broader regional conflict that no doubt in my mind we would be sucked into one way or the other. I don't think we'd ever get boots on the ground, but it's not out of the question. Uh, Without a doubt, our Navy and our Air Force would be engaged in such a conflict. No doubt. They were engaged over the weekend. Our Navy, our Air Force were shooting down those drones, shooting down those missiles, helping to, uh, you know, try to avoid any casualties that would have led to a, a demand by the Israelis for a full uh, retort towards Iran. But no, we're not going to talk about that. We're not going to have, you know, you know, military analysts and people with real experience on this issue uh, come up and talk about what's going on there. What we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to have uh, some reporters and legal analysts outside the courtroom waiting for news that's not going to come for two weeks. Okay, just, just keep this in mind. I, I mean, unless there's somehow a mistrial or somehow one of these appeals make it through and they stop the case, there will be no news on this until the jury is sat. Sat? Seated. Until the jury is seated. And once the jury is seated, they will start with opening statements. And then you're going to start getting some news. Then there'll be something to report about. And and we could keep our people there just sitting there breathlessly waiting for information to come out of the courtroom. But them sitting there right now, it's just like, I guess it's an excuse to be on location. I, I like location shots. Don't get me wrong, especially on a beautiful spring day like today. But it's supposed to rain later in the week. I wonder if they're going to keep them outside the courthouse on a rainy day when there's no news coming out of the courthouse. That, that'll be, the, that'll be the, uh, the thing I'm watching for me this week. Listen to this. I'll be right back. Welcome back. I am Chris Hahn. I'm at Christopher Hahn on X, Christopher Hahn, NY on Instagram, and ChristopherHahn.com. Uh, you could follow me on social media on those places, and you could watch me on News Nation. I'm on all the time. I'll be on uh, tomorrow night at 7 p.m., And I'll be on at other points in time during the week. So check me out on News Nation. If you don't know where News Nation is, go to newsnation.com and find out. If you got cable, it's on that. If you're streaming, you probably got it there too. Uh, So check it out. You'll like it. It's news for all Americans. And if you like me here, you're going to love me there. And of course, download the Aggressive Progressive Podcast. New episodes every Tuesday. So check me out there wherever you get your podcasts. All right. So... um, yeah, so the national media is going to be breathless with this. And again, I want to get back to what matters with this trial. Now, I do believe he'll be convicted. Uh, I think he believes he'll be convicted. I think that he has said on many occasions that he's done this. It's just not a crime or he should not be held accountable for it, even though his attorney has been held accountable for it. Uh, but I think what matters is how the American people react to it. And again, I don't expect the base to move. The base is the base. The base is Marjorie Taylor Greenish. They love her. They love him. They love his antics, right? But how do those people who hate both Biden and Trump, right? If you look at the polls right now, there are people who, you know, they're double haters. That's what they're calling them in the news. Double haters. How do the double haters react to what's going on in New York City right now. Do the double haters start liking Trump more because of his antics? See, this is my theory of the case here. 
His antics are not helping with the double haters. The antics are actually pushing the double haters to hate him more. And if they hate him more, they're not going to vote for him and they're going to vote for Biden, right? If they're planning on voting and they don't like them both, they're going to move towards Biden. And again, it doesn't have to be a huge move, right? You got to assume that the preferences of the double haters splits evenly between Biden and Trump. But the double haters are persuadable, right? They are people who can, you know, move. There aren't a lot of them. There aren't a lot of them in America. Maybe 10% of the election, electorate. But it only takes a 1% move in either. That's like a 1% move among the double haters is like a 20% move in the base, in my opinion. It's a huge thing. It swings the election. And when Stormy Daniels comes to the microphone and retells what she told the jury, I don't know how that's good for Donald Trump. I don't think it helps him with the double haters. As I've said before, I'm sure that there are some people who are consider themselves Christian conservatives, far-right religious conservatives, who actually still believe in family values, who aren't hypocrites. I don't think they're all hypocrites. I, I just don't believe they're all hypocrites. Some of them are, without a doubt, and we know who they are. We, we've seen Joel Olstein's commercials, right? We know who these people are who are hypocrites. Jerry Farwell Jr. We know, we know who they are. But, you know, the, the couple in Wisconsin who lives on a dairy farm, who, you know, goes to church every Sunday, pays their taxes, believes in the Constitution and America, maybe voted for Trump twice. But are good, God-fearing people, are they going to react to a porn star talking about her sexual escapades with Donald Trump in a positive way? Now, I don't think that gets them to vote for Joe Biden, but it might get them to stay home and not vote. And that's not good for Trump either. Look, I, I, I truly believe that Joe Biden is going to win this election. And the only thing that could stand in his way from winning this election is something happening to him physically that makes America say, oh, wait a minute, we can't trust him to be president for four years. But barring that, and again, I don't think that's going to happen either. I think he's a healthy guy for even though he's 80 years old, 81 years old, looks pretty healthy to me. Looks pretty spry. I get it. He's lost a step. I've lost a step and I'm 30 years younger than him. It's, it's, it is what it is. You lose a step. It happens. I told you about my half marathon. I was not happy with it. Yes, I ran faster than most people my age, but not what I'm used to. But that's the way it is. It beats the alternative. You get older, you slow down, you miss a step. Doesn't mean you're not wise. Doesn't mean you haven't been around the block a few times. Doesn't mean you haven't made some mistakes and learned from them, which Joe Biden clearly has, right? And I think wisdom is something that we we overlook in our political process at our peril. I think wisdom that comes from experience is something that should be valued far more than it is. I mean, we want the new shiny object, We want the person who's going to move us through their speeches. Yeah, I I get it. Joe Biden is no Barack Obama. He is no Bill Clinton. But Joe Biden has worked his tail off in government for six decades. He has seen it all. He has made every mistake you've ever had in politics and government. And I believe he has learned from them. From them. And I think that we are the beneficiaries of that experience. I think he's been a very good president thus far. Do I wish he'd be better on the campaign trail? Of course. Do I wish he'd be, you know, the Joe Biden we knew 20 years ago? Of course. But I also like the fact that he's got 20 more years of experience than he did 20 years ago. And I think that's good for America. And we live in a very, very dangerous world. Look at what's going on in Iran right now. Look what's going on in Ukraine. Look what they're saying in China. Experience matters. Biden has it. Listen to this. I'll be right back. I don't want to stress you out. I, I've been talking about this a lot. We're talking about the tone and tenor 
of the conversation in America. Obviously, I've been taking some ownership of my role in it. And I'm not saying I'm going to stop to all the stations out there that expect the aggressive progressive every time I come on the air, uh, rallying up the audiences. I'm going to continue to do that. Just once in a while, I want to check in with everybody. And particularly on a Friday afternoon, I think, you know, one one segment of a rant that I think everybody can agree with. I think if you don't agree that we should be having civilized debates and conversations about the issues, um, I, you know, you're just looking for entertainment and just go to the movies. Uh, you know, I'll give you a recommendation of something to watch on Netflix. I actually just watched this thing called Three Body Problem. You should check it out. It's very good. If you like sci-fi, check it out. But, uh, you know, that's not what, you know, we should be looking for in a conversation about how we pick the leader of the free world. We should be looking for a real conversation so that undecided voters can get a real view of what these candidates stand for. And even, by the way, people who may have already made up their mind will have another chance to take a look at their candidates and uh, determine if their issues or their stance on the issues are right for them. I, I truly believe that debates have been a missed opportunity for America the last, you know, Really, for the last 30, 40 years, it's been a while since there's been a real, I mean, a real debate that mattered. Uh, The Kennedy-Nixon debates, there was only one, uh, there was only one microphone, one podium. They just walked over to it, talked to the camera. No studio audience either. By the way, that's another thing. Like, Why do we need a studio audience? They bring in their own crowds. They cheer for their stuff. Enough of this nonsense. It should be a silent room. It should be a studio with no audience watching these debates. I don't need to hear them cheer. Oh, did you hear the applause? And then the pundits go, oh, did you hear the pundits? I Clearly it was Trump's room. Clearly it was Biden's room. BS. The room is whoever brought the, the louder of the people, right? They, these people are not random selectees in the room. You bring a rowdy crowd to the room, the crowd will be with you. We don't need that. We don't need that. What we need are answers to real questions and a real conversation about the issues, not a superficial, you know, soundbite laden, made for TV moment. I don't think you want that either. And here I am, I'm getting like worked up. Last segment of the week, right? I want to send you into the weekend feeling good, feeling relaxed, but I'm worked up about it. I'm worked up, I'm charged up about the need for a real conversation, a real dialogue in politics. I I think that conversations help. And I think a good conversation could be healing, frankly. I think if Joe Biden and Donald Trump were up there actually having a conversation about you know, the issues, like a legitimate, normal conversation without name calling, without accusations. I think it would be healing from now. I I don't know that that's possible, right? But I do think it would be healing for the nation if, if that was to happen. You know, people maybe wouldn't be as afraid. We talked earlier in the week about the fear. So many voters feeling right now about the election. Maybe if they saw these candidates having a boring conversation about the job of the presidency, talking about complex issues in a manner that is like stable and calm and even keeled without all of the dramatics we've been seeing from Trump, mostly. Admit it, if you're a Trump supporter, admit it, he's the drama guy, right? Biden, you know, he was calling him Sleepy Joe for a reason. And it's the best thing about Joe Biden, in my opinion, is that he's sleepy. But if we could get out, get away with a debate where these two candidates from the major parties in this country have a conversation about the issues in a calm way, it would go a long way towards starting healing in America where we're not demonizing each other, we're not at each other's throats, when we're just having a conversation like we used to do in this country about what's best for America. No, we don't sit there. You know, Biden doesn't call him a criminal. Maybe the courts are going to do that for him. Who knows? Trump doesn't call Biden corrupt or whatever he's calling him right now. But they just have a conversation. They just talk. They talk it over and we all listen. And then we can make a choice based on fact, 
and issues and who we think it has the best grasp of them and who we think will do it the way we want to do it. I don't know. Maybe I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one to quote a great man. Uh, it's just It just is what it is. We don't live in a world where that's happening right now. We live in a world where people are talking like me, only they're not on the radio trying to get people to listen. They're running for Congress and Senate and governor and mayor and unfortunately, president of the United States. And if we could get away from that, if we get to a point where we have real conversations, all of this vitriol will stop. The reason why we're at each other's throats, the reason why so many of us are stressed out day in and day out is because this is all we hear and it's all we know. And we think it's always going to be like that. Well, I'm telling you right now, it hasn't always been that way. It's only been this way for a little while. And eventually we could get back to a place in America, I think, I believe, I have faith, where we all just say, hey, you know, I might disagree with you on the issue, but I think you're a good person. Remember John McCain doing that for Barack Obama? Wasn't that long ago. But it was a beautiful moment, whether you agreed with John McCain on anything else or not. That was a beautiful moment. We haven't had a lot of moments like that since that that, that moment, honestly. 2016 campaign had no moments like that. 2020 campaign had no moments like that. 2024 campaign will not have moments like that. I think we all wish there were more. So all I'm saying is relax. Everything is going to be okay. All right. I'm going to remind you now, as I always do, to seek the truth, to question everyone and everything, even me. Seek the truth. I know it's out there, and I know you'll find it if you look for it. And I'll be back here again next week to tell you the truth as I see it. I'm Chris Hahn. Thanks for listening to the Aggressive Progressive Podcast.